across Salt Lake City, and uh, he will give a rationality of angle determinantal rings. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, uh, I want to thank Anurag Singh for uh, coming many times to our department and uh, initiating workshops and giving wonderful lectures. And it is because of him and uh, a few other people like Watanabe, so that many of our young uh, researchers could make a beginning in characteristic P competitive algebra. We are really grateful to him. And uh, today uh, he will, uh, he has another very interesting topic to uh, talk, talk about. So I welcome him uh, once again. And uh, Anurag, you can begin your talk. Thank you, Jukhar. So an audience, course. yeah, I, I request the audience to uh, relay their questions on the chat. And after the talk, uh, we will have a free discussion. Anybody can uh, speak to him, uh, have a discussion about the topic of the seminar. So right now, we will all uh, mute our mics and uh, videos and listen to Anurag. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Jugal. So uh, thank you very much to Jayant and Priti Jugal for organizing this. Uh, it's wonderful to be part of this group. Um, I hope everyone is doing well in these complicated times. I was actually supposed to be at uh, IIT Bombay uh, for a few weeks in the month of May, but of course, uh, as you know, all of the all of that all of those plans were changed. Uh, but it's nice to be part of this virtual seminar, nonetheless. So, what I'm talking about today is joint work with uh, Aldo Konka, Maral Mustafa Zadifard, and Matteo Barbaro. And uh, and, and the, I mean, the title is The F Rationality of Henkel Determinantal Rings. I will say what Henkel Determinantal Rings are uh, uh, soon, of course. So, throughout this talk, K will denote a field, and the rings that we consider, the rings R that we consider, will be finitely generated K algebras with, a, with an n grading such that the zeroth part of the ring is a field. M will denote the homogeneous maximal ideal of R. And in this uh, graded context, typically, in fact, even the standard graded context, meaning the rings will be generated by forms of equal degree. The goal here is to is a modest one, is to discuss some families of rings that are F rational. So let me begin with, so perhaps one should start by saying that uh, polynomial rings are indeed F rational. And uh, we saw this in Mitra's talk uh, two days ago. And some other large families of rings um, include determinantal rings and their and their uh, variations. So let me start with generic determinantal rings. So we have fixed a field K. Over this field, take an R by S matrix of variables, matrix of indeterminates, and look at the homomorphic image of the polynomial ring in those indeterminates modulo the ideal generated by size t minors of that matrix of variables. So when I write k adjoint x, I mean a polynomial ring in R times s variables. And it of x is the ideal generated by the t by t minors of that matrix, meaning the, the determinants of t by t submatrices. So in this manner, we have written R as a homomorphic image of a polynomial ring. But as it happens, these generic determinantal rings, they're also subrings of, poly of polynomial rings in the following manner. So we had said X was R by S, an R by S matrix. Take new matrices of variables, Y and Z, where R is, sorry, where Y is R by T minus one, and Z is T minus one by S. So this means that the product matrix YZ is an R by S matrix. So the generic determinantal ring surjects onto, uh, entry wise onto uh, the, en the entries of the matrix YZ. And this surjection is really an isomorphism. If you think about it, the uh, since Y and Z, the smaller of the dimensions we set to be T minus one, the product matrix YZ has rank at most T minus one. So it's size T minors are zero. This ensures that we have a surjection from the generic determinantal ring to K 
a join by Z. And then one has to check that this is actually an isomorphism. So generic determinantal rings are in this manner. They're also subrings of polynomial rings. And this much is true without, without any extra assumptions on the field K. Suppose we do put one extra assumption on, on the field K, namely that it's infinite. Then, then this generic determinantal ring, it's uh, not just the subring of the polynomial ring in that manner, but also the ring of invariance for a group acting on that polynomial ring. So once again, in, when, when the field K is infinite, we can get this uh, subring of a polynomial ring as an invariant ring. And the action is as follows. So the group that we use is the group of, t, of size t minus 1 uh, invertible matrices, the general linear group of size t minus 1. And the action is as specified near the bottom of the slide. So a matrix M from the general linear group, it sends the entries of y entry-wise to those of y m inverse and the entries of z to m z. So this action is set up uh, precisely so that the entries of the product matrix yz go to those of y m inverse mz. m inverse m is of course the identity. We call m is invertible. So in short, the entries of yz go to the corresponding entries of yz. So this is a this shows that the entries of, of the product matrix are fixed, and it takes more work to show that those entries indeed generate the invariant ring. So one, one does need, as, as stated, one does need here that the field K is infinite because otherwise the, if K is a finite field, the corresponding general linear group will be a finite group. And then a, you know, the polynomial ring on which the group is acting and the invariant ring in the finite group case, they would have the same dimension. So in other words, there would be many, many more invariants. Uh, that being said, let me repeat the fact that the description of R as a subring of a polynomial ring works independent of the characteristic of the field or the size of the field. Now, these some properties of these generic determinantal rings. So they are known to be Cohen-Macaulay in full generality. And in, uh, I'm talking about the general case. This is due to Hoxter and Egan from 1971. Various cases had been examined and um, handled prior to that. But in this generality, the result is due to Hoxter and Egan. They are always normal. And coming closer to the uh, topic for today, they are F rational when K has positive characteristic. And this is due to Hoxter and Hunicke. So, if K is a field of characteristic, of characteristic P bigger than zero, no other restrictions on P, then these generate determinantal rings are F rational. And this is, I mean, it's not hard, but it is a slightly delicate proof. And as far as I know, one does have to get into the, the, um, the business of straightening, one has to get into the business of straightening laws to prove this. Um, once one has the result that they are F rational in the positive characteristic case, it's one can use that to conclude that they have rational singularities in characteristic zero. For example, by the theorem of Karen Smith that we saw in Mitra's talk, namely that rings of F rational type are. Uh, uh, sorry. Yes, please. Uh, Parangam is asking are they F regular? Uh, yes, they are. They are. Yes, I should, uh, I should have said that because that's a stronger statement. And indeed, that is what they prove. Uh, somehow, uh, in this talk, my, you know, my main concern mm -hmm. is the rationality. So I, uh, but yes, yeah. they're regular and that's uh, a good point. The, the reason is that for Gorenstein rings, F rationality and F regularity are equivalent. And In the generic determinantal case, one can um, the the Gorenstein case is precisely when the matrix of variables is square. 
So one can embed a, the, a rectangular matrix of variables inside. One can add extra variables to make it square and reduce to the Gorenstein case. And then once one knows the Gorenstein case, uh, one can um, conclude the result for an algebra retract of that uh, as well. So, but yes, they are f-regular. And uh, thanks for bringing that up. So, so as, as we were saying, suppose one knows the positive characteristics result, namely that they have, that they're f-rational for every positive characteristic P, in particular for almost all choices of the characteristic, then Karen Smith's result implies that they have rational singularities. This is uh, referring back to Mitra's talk. In characteristic zero, one also has uh, perhaps, an, uh, uh, perhaps an easier way or at least a different way to conclude that these have rational singularities. And that is by Bhutto's theorem. So Bhutto's theorem um, um, says that for finitely generated algebras over a field of characteristic zero, the property of having rational singularities is inherited by pure subrings. I will say on the next slide what I mean by a pure subring. Um, the finitely generated algebras over a field might be slightly, the, the hypothesis I've put down might be slightly stronger, but to be honest, that's all I need for this talk. So I phrased it in those terms. So I need to say what a pure subring, what I mean by a pure subring. So in general, a homomorphism of rings is pure if it's injective, a homomorphism R to S is pure if it's injective after tensoring with an arbitrary R module. So in particular, the homomorphism is injective and it stays injective after, uh, after tensoring. Now, in the case of characteristic zero, if we realize our generic determinantal ring as a um, as an invariant ring for the action of the general linear group, then we can use the fact that in characteristic zero, this general linear group is linearly reductive. And what this tells us is that the inclusion of this uh, um, generic determinantal ring thought of as k adjoined yz inside the polynomial ring in the variables y's and z's, this has an R module splitting. In other words, said otherwise, there is a Reynolds operator in the sense of uh, Craig's talk that started the whole seminar series. So um, R is a direct sum of S as an R module. In other words, as R modules, we can write S as R direct sum of complement. And then it's clear that no matter what we tensor with, the, we will retain an injective map. So, since R is a direct sum of S as an R module, it follows that R to S is pure. And then we can appeal to Bhutto's theorem. Um, I should say that in our, the way we use this S was a polynomial ring. So it has no singular, it has no singularities. And that counts as having at most rational singularities. When I say something has rational singularities, a more pedantic way would be to say that it has at most rational singularities. So since the polynomial ring has at most rational singularities, so does its pure subring R, this being in the characteristic zero case. Sorry, is there a question? Uh, uh, yes, from Sudhir Ghorpade. Yes. When you say the determinant ring is a ring of invariance, are you looking at the maximal minor case? Uh, no, in, in, gen in general. So he's asking yeah. how does it follow in general? So in general, the action the action is as on this slide, but it takes a proof that when k is infinite, we um, it takes a proof that there are no more invariants than uh, than we claim that the entries of Y Z do generate. Uh, so I mean, this is true as stated. It's I'm not saying that the proof is apparent, but. But I mean, this can be found, for example, in, in, in Herman Weil's classical groups uh, uh -huh. in, in this generality. Is that okay? Okay, yeah, he says okay. I can, I can send references, of course, uh, I can email references after and yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So, so just to uh, re refresh, if our interest is characteristic zero, we could use Butoh's theorem and conclude that determinable rings have rational singularities. And then having uh, you know, used that characteristic zero result, we could use the theorem of say, uh, of theorems of Hara or Mehta and Srinivas that we saw in Mitra's talk and conclude that the rings have are F rational for large choices of the characteristic P for almost all choices of the characteristic P. But using the characteristic result, we cannot conclude it for each P. For each P, as far as I know, one has to resort to the straightening law type arguments, and that's due to Hoxter and Hunicke. Um, it's, the, it's there in their paper in the uh, Journal of Algebraic Geometry from, um, from 1994. Okay, now the, the, the main the features of this uh, family of examples, the generic determinable rings, um, they, the, the same properties are exhibited by two other families of uh, examples, namely symmetric determinable rings and those uh, defined by Fafians. And let me quickly go over those. So for the symmetric determinable case, take an n by n symmetric matrix of, of variables and go mod the size t minors. So these are what I'm calling symmetric determinantal rings. Once again, these are subrings of polynomial rings. Uh, this time take a new matrix of variables y that has size t minus one by n. So since y has size t minus one by n, y transpose y has size n by n add its size t minors are surely zero since y had rank t minus one. So in this manner, one gets one can set up the one can realize R as this as a subring of the polynomial ring in the entries y's. Uh, specifically, R is generated over k by the entries of y transpose y. And once again, if k is an infinite field, this is not just a subring but an invariant ring, namely for an action of the orthogonal group where a matrix M takes the entries of Y to those of MY. The point being that if Y goes, if the entries of Y goes, go to those of MY, then those of Y transpose Y go to Y transpose, M transpose, MY. And of course being orthogonal equivalently means that M transpose M is the identity. So um, we get the equality at the bottom on the last line of the slide. Once again, these are uh, uh, Cohen-Macaulay, normal, uh, in positive characteristic, they're F-rational, better still F-regular in all characteristics. In characteristic zero, they have rational singularities. The comments about Butoh's theorem and uh, et cetera apply in characteristic zero, just as in the previous family of examples. Next, the Fafian rings. So this time X is N by N skew symmetric and R is the homomorphic image modulo the, Fafian, the size two T Fafians of X, T being some fixed unspecified number. Um, it's Yes, it's a subring of a polynomial ring in the, in, the, in the entries of a matrix Y that has size twice T minus two by N Specifically, R can be identified with K adjoint, the entries of the matrix Y transpose omega Y, where omega is this so-called standard symplectic block. It's uh, zero identity, negative identity zero, um, identity matrix of the right size, I guess size T minus one. And not surprisingly, um, it's, you know, it's a subring always, that subring is a uh, invariant ring for a group action when the group is infinite. And the action this time is the symplectic group of side twice t minus two. So, uh, the action being entries of y go to those of my for m and n of the symplectic group. Uh, 
so that the entries of y transpose omega y get sent to the entries of y transpose m transpose omega m y and m being symplectic is m, m being symplectic is precisely the condition that m transpose omega y coinc coincides with omega so so these are sort of three uh, uh, yes, these are f regular, f rational, rational singularities in the corresponding cases. The same, the exact same uh, um, properties as in the previous examples. Um, next, I'll start the Henkel case. Unless there are questions, uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box. Thanks, so okay. you can continue. So, by a Henkel matrix of indeterminates, we mean a matrix of variables where the diagonals along a fixed direction are constant. So here, um, x1 is in the top left corner, x2 occurs on the next diagonal, x3 on the next diagonal, and so forth. And um, that's the Henkel matrix of variables. By a Henkel determinantal ring, we mean, of course, the polynomial ring in the x size modulo the size t minors of the Henkel matrix. So these are perhaps not quite as well studied as the previous examples, but they, they do show up in uh, Room's book from, I think, 1938, The Geometry of Determinate Loci. So these do go back a long ways as well. Um, and later in the talk, we will see how and where they show up in a, um, in a natural way. Okay. So by Henkel determinate rings, we mean um, a field K adjoins the entries of a Henkel matrix of indeterminates modulo the size D minors. So in this small example, I have a three by three Henkel matrix on the left and a two by four Henkel matrix on the right. Now in each case, if we take the size two minors, it's easy to check that the ideal generated by the size two minors on the left and the right coincide. To be just um, to be careful, I'm I'm not saying that every minor that the, that the every minor on the left shows up on the right and vice versa. We're just saying that the ideals are the same. As a baby example, if I look at on the left, I have the minor x3 squared minus x1 x5. I don't literally see this as a minor on the right, but it's a difference or a sum of two minors on the right. Um, by the equation in the middle of the page. This is not um, just a coincidence. Um, a paper of, in, in a paper from 1982, Grousseau and Pesquin proved that as long as t, the size of the minors we're taking, is less than or equal to r and s, the dimensions of the matrix, I should say I'm always going to assume that when we're taking minors, minors of a size, um, <laughs> that less than or equal to the dimensions of the matrix so as to avoid some degenerate cases. So the, the, um, the observation of Bruce and Peskin is that given a Henkel matrix, I can rearrange the variables just as we see at the top of the slide, and the ideal of minors remains the same. So if I look at an R by S Henkel matrix and its size T minors, that's much the same as if I rearrange those variables, so come up with a T by R plus S minus T ankle matrix of variables. So this has an advantage, namely that if I'm studying Henkel determinantal rings, I can always um, reduce to the case where it's maximal minors. I can always take the that rectangle of matrices, for example, the three by three rectangle at the top left page, and rearrange them into into um, a case where I'm looking at maximal minors, such as on the top right of this slide. And um, as, you know, behind Sudhir's so question, the maximal minor case often ends up being easier or nicer. So there are, there are indeed advantages to um, reducing to the maximal minor case, which is something one can do for free in the Henkel uh, in the study of Henkel determinantal rings, thanks to Brusson Pesquin. Now, 
why is the maximal minor case nicer in our in our context so i could look at a generic p by n determinantal ring and i've used the um, the letter y for the generic case on this slide just because the entries of h were called x's so i don't want to add to the confusion so the generic t by n determinantal ring meaning mod size mod size t minors that determinantal ring it has a natural subjection onto the t by n uh, mod size t minor henkel determinantal ring and what does this uh, surjection entail so going from the generic to the henkel we are making our diagonals constant in other words we are specializing in things of the form y sub i comma j plus one minus y i plus one j to zero that's what it entails to make the diagonals constant and when we're doing this in the maximal minor case the elements that we are killing the elements that we're specializing to zero they form part of a system of parameters for the generic determinantal ring this is easy to check using for example a dimension count and so what this tells us is that henkel determinantal rings viewing them from the maximal minor standpoint they are specializations of generic determinantal rings by by a regular sequence by part of a system of parameters so using the result that generic determinantal rings are cohen macaulay it's immediate that so are henkel determinantal rings um, so so as we said they're cohen macaulay they're also normal as is proved in a, by eisenberg in a paper from 1988 um, in fact, I think the title of Eisenberg's paper is Linear Specializations of uh, Determinantal Varieties. Um, as we said a moment ago, Henkel determinantal rings are precisely linear specializations uh, of determinantal rings, specializations by regular sequence. Um, it's dimension twice t, they're dimension twice t minus two. But so t is the, you know, um, t minus recall. So viewing them as maximal minors, the, the number of columns in our rectangle does not feature in the dimension. We'll uh, return to this point later on the slide in a second. Since I'm listing some properties of Henkel determinantal rings, and um, let me also mention that uh, since we saw some wonderful talks on set theoretic complete dissections, I should say that the ideal ith so size of so the determinants by by minors of a henkel matrix of variables these are always set theoretic complete the sections and i think the first case of this uh, this is this is in a paper of uh, tito walla and as i recall i was first taught this by professor koshik at iit bombay when we were doing a summer school in 2011 so if Professor Koshik is there, I wanted to uh, acknowledge that. Uh, thanks. Returning, coming back, we said they're dimension twice t minus two. Now, if I, um, on the slide, I've marked off triangles in red on the top, on the top left and the bottom right. These are the, these are the variables that, you know, occur on the shorter diagonals, so to speak. So there are precisely two t minus two of these variables in the that occur on the shorter diagonals, the ones that are cordoned off by red triangles. So if I if I specialize these to zero, the after specialization, it's easy to see, for example, that x sub t to the power t would be zero, and likewise that all degree n monomials in the remaining variables would be zero. So this is a rather convenient choice of a homogeneous system of parameters for our Henkel determinantal ring. So specifically, the variables that occur on the shorter diagonals, on the diagonals that have less than t elements, x1 through xt minus 1, and then over on the right side, xn plus 1 
up to the last xi. These form a homogeneous system of parameters for Henkel determinable rings. They are precisely 2t minus 2 of these. If I work modulo the system of parameters, the resulting Artinian ring has a uh, nice and simple description as displayed here. Uh, in particular, the circle is spanned by the size, sorry, the circle is spanned by the degree t minus 1 monomials in the remaining variables. So from this, one can compute the A invariant of the ring. It's uh, 1 minus t. So for the story to be, mean for anything to be meaningful, we probably do want that we are working, that t is at least 2. And in that case, the A invariant will indeed be negative. Again, referring to something from Mitra's talk. Moving to an uh, alternative description of Henkel determinantal rings, let's start with the case of a 2 by 4 Henkel matrix of variables mod the size 2 minors. So you probably rec recognize this as the homogeneous coordinate ring for the four-rupel embedding of P1. Uh, if you prefer for the Veronese subring of a polynomial ring in two variables called u and x here. So if u and x are new variables, the fourth Veronese subring of this polynomial ring is generated over k by u to the four, u cube x, u square x square, u x cube and x to the four. I could arrange these as a Henkel matrix as on the top of the page. And for sure, the size two matrix, the size two minus of this matrix would be zero. And this is indeed an isomorphism, for example, by dimension code. So uh, akin to this, if I'm looking at a two by n Henkel determinantal ring, this is uh, a, homo a homogeneous coordinate ring for the nth, uh, uh, for the uh, n-uple embedding of P1 in projective space. Now recall that this two by four matrix of variables, we could also uh, rearrange it into a three by three matrix of variables. This is the, um, you know, the, akin to the Pesk, the, the Bruce Peskin uh, result I had mentioned here. So the two by four Henkel case mod size two minors is much the same as three by three mod the size two minors. The proj of either of these rings is the homogeneous coordinate ring for P1 and P4. And with that in mind, take new variables y and sorry v and y, and look at the corresponding matrix in the new variables as well. So I'm looking at two three by three matrix. Each of them, the size two minors are readily seen to be zero. So the matrix to the left, with u to the four, u cube x, etc., it has rank at most one, I realize it's exactly one. And likewise, the matrix on the right, v, v to the four, v cube y, et cetera, it has rank at most one. Now, if I add two matrices that have rank at most one, I get a matrix that has rank at most two. And that's the matrix uh, displayed in the middle of this page. So the three by three matrix, u to the four plus v to the four, next entry u cube x plus v cube y, v cube y et cetera, et cetera. This is a matrix with entries in the polynomial ring in the variables u, v, x, and y. For sure, the size three minors of this matrix, namely the determinant of this matrix is zero. And that's because this is a sum of two matrices having rank, each having rank at most one. So, what we're doing here is effectively considering the, the sequent variety to this embedding of P1 and P4. Think of the U's and X's as parametrizing a point, the V's and the Y's as parametrizing, parametrizing the second point, and then we're looking at the linear span. So this is the sequent variety of, of uh, the, the, the sequent of lines, the sequent in the traditional sense in the uh, baby calculus course sense of the word. Now, since this since this three by three 
uh, matrix with entries in the polynomial ring u, v, x, and y. Since its determinant was zero, I can get a surjection from the three by three Henkel determinantal ring onto the subring of the polynomial ring generated by the entries like u to the four plus v to the four, et cetera, as displayed here. So one gets, since the matrix on the right has determinant zero, I get a, um, I get a surjection and then a dimension count confirms that this is really an isomorphism. So what we have done here is write the Henkel determinantal ring, the three by three Henkel determinantal ring mod the determinant of that matrix as a subring of a polynomial ring. The polynomial ring is in the symbols U, V, X, and Y. The subring is generated by the elements displayed on the top right uh, corner of this page. So this is uh, um, um, so the, this, this Henkel ring is a homogeneous coordinate ring for the secant variety to P1 in P4. Similarly, one can play the game for larger, for arbitrary Henkel determinantal rings as well. So if I have a T by N Henkel matrix of variables and I go mod the size T minors, this is isom this is can be viewed as a subring of a polynomial ring in twice T minus two symbols. The new variables I've labeled as U1 through U sub T minus one and x1 through, sub, through x sub t minus 1, and is generated by um, elements as displayed over here. So these are forms of degree n plus t minus 2. Um, how many forms? Well, as many as <laughs> make sense for the exponents to be non-negative. So, um, so, so, I mean, you know, rather than obsess about the indices here, let me just say we're doing, you know, the analog of this construction works in full generality, meaning for and Henkel matrix of variables mod size t minors. So Henkel determinantal rings are indeed subrings of polynomial rings in a natural way. The, the word natural here is not technical. All I mean is um, the the, um, the description that comes out of viewing these as higher sequent varieties, the embeddings of P1. So the embedding of P1 gave us a rational normal curve. We're looking at the first case we saw was uh, the first sequent variety, the sequent of lines, if you will. And then in general, one is looking at uh, higher sequence um, sequence of planes and so forth. So the proj of the T by N Henkel determinantal ring is the, uh, I think the T minus two at secant of an embedding of P1. So if I have this straight, my notation would be that the zero at secant is the rational normal curve itself. The first secant is a secant of lines and then so forth. Okay, so to repeat a Henkel determinantal ring, just as with the examples at the beginning of the talk, it is always a subring of a polynomial ring. Uh, but an essential difference is once we get beyond the, the rational normal curve case, once we get to uh, minors of size three or bigger, um, this subring of a polynomial ring, it's, it's, it's not a pure subring even in characteristic zero. So we will prove that on the next slide, but just to repeat, Henkel determinantal rings, they're always subrings of polynomial rings, but size three and beyond, they are never pure subrings of that polynomial ring. By that polynomial ring, I mean the one that's naturally coming out of the sequent description. So why are they not pure subrings? The argument in the three by three case is as good as the argument in the general case. So I will stick to that for the sake of simplified notation. So in the three by three Henkel case, we could think of our Henkel determinantal ring as generated by the binomials u to the four plus v to the four, u cube x plus v cube y 
etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, sitting inside the polynomial ring in U, V, X, and Y. So the Henkel ring is being called R. The polynomial ring is being called S. Each of these has dimension four. Recall that for Henkel rings, the dimension was twice t minus two. So if t is three, two t minus two is four. Now, if I look at the homogeneous maximal ideal of the Henkel guy and expand it to S, then it's contained in an ideal generated by three elements, namely u minus x, v minus y, and for example, x to the four plus y to the four. The reason is that if I work mod u minus x and v minus y, so mod u minus x and v minus y, each of my generators of the, each of my specified generators of the homogeneous maximal ideal of R takes the form x to the four plus y to the four. So the expansion of the maximal ideal of R to the ring S has smaller height, the height drops. Now this means that if I look at the inclusion of R and S and tensor with the fourth local cohomology of R supported at its maximal ideal, well, one, when I do the tensor, my source is the local cohomology of R, the fourth local cohomology of R at its maximal ideal, and that's surely non-zero because it's R is a um, ring of dimension four, I'm looking at cohomology supported at the maximal, that's the non-zero by say, growth index non-vanishing. And on the right, I have the fourth local cohomology of S supported in, at an ideal of smaller height. So by hotshot lichtenbaum vanishing, the that target module is zero. So I'm going from a non-zero module to a zero module. The map cannot possibly be injective. So, R to S cannot be pure. When I tensor with this specific module, namely the local cohomology of R, the result is not injective. And this same uh, calculation extends to the general case. So for three by, for Henkel's uh, of size defined by minus of size three or larger, the inclusion in the polynomial ring uh, is not pure, whatever the characteristic might be. Now, the surprising thing here is that even though the embedding of R and S is not pure, it ends up being useful. Uh, specifically, it's useful enough to for f-rationality considerations, as we'll get to soon. Okay, so in our case, R to S is not pure. When R to S is pure and S is a polynomial ring, why is that a good thing? So, well, if R to S is, so this uh, um, was used in Craig's talk uh, earlier in this uh, seminar series. If R to S is pure and S is a polynomial ring, it's immediate, say the positive characteristic case that R is F regular or F rational, if, um, either of those. And the reason is straightforward. So take an arbitrary ideal I of R and consider its tight closure in the ring R. Now, going back to the definition of tight closure, say from Mitra's talk, whatever is in the tight closure of I lands in, uh, in the ring R, ends up in the tight closure of I S in the ring S. My non-zero element C in R continues to be a non-zero element C in S. S is a polynomial ring, R is surely a domain. And in the, in the polynomial ring S, the tight closure of any ideal is itself. So this means that I star is contained in I S. Now we're also assuming that R to S is pure, which means that if I tensor this at R mod I, the result is injective. Namely R mod I to S mod I S is injective. Restated I S intersect R is I. So if we combine these two observations, we get that I star is contained in I S intersect R but which is just I. In other words, I star is I. In other words, the ideal I, which was arbitrary, is slightly closed. So when R to S is pure and S is a polynomial ring, it's immediate that R is F regular. Unfortunately, in the Henkel case, 
aside from the two by two setup, our extensions are not pure, but they will still help. Um, so they will still help. They'll help us prove the following theorem. If the characteristic of K is a, is a prime that's greater than or equal to T, then the Henkel determinant ring um, defined by size T minors is F rational. So the proof of this is uh, um, amazingly easy and something we wa I want to go through next. So once again, what we're shooting for is in positive prime characteristic, that's at least the smaller of the dimensions of the Henkel matrix, the Henkel determinant ring is F rational. So we'll be using the uh, theorem of Hoekstra and Hunicke from uh, um, this paper from 1994. So the setup is uh, what has been our setup for the most part today. R is an n-graded ring finitely generated over a field. The zeroth part is indeed that field. And at the moment, it has positive characteristic. Uh, a mild hypothesis, R is going to be, assume that R is equidimensional. Our rings are going to be domains, so that's not really much of a restriction. Then R is F rational, if and only if there is one homogeneous system of parameters that generates a tightly closed ideal. So why have I, I mean, uh, I should say, you know, why is this a theorem? I mean, what is uh, involved in proving this? So, def so the definition of F rationality, for example, from Mithra's talk is that, you know, a ring is F rational if localizing at each uh, prime ideal or each maximal ideal, the result is F rational. So the, the content of this theorem takes two forms. Uh, one is that in the graded case, it's enough to consider a localization, for example, at the homogeneous maximal ideal. And that needs something of a, you know, an open loci type of result. So, I mean, it's the sort of thing one would hope is true and it is indeed true, but it does take a proof. And the other is that in the local case, under some mild hypothesis like equidimensional, um, it's enough to, instead of looking at all systems of parameters, it's enough to get down to just one. So that's, um, you know, those two things are really the content of this theorem. Um, and we will use this. So in short, in our graded context, to verify F rationality, it's enough to show that the ideal generated by one homogeneous system of parameters is tightly closed. Now let's return to this three by three uh, Henkel hypersurface hypersurface since the ideal of size three minus is really just generated by the determinant. And we had identified this with a subring of the of a polynomial ring. Uh, and that identification is repeated on the top of this page. Now, with this description, I want to verify that the ideal generated by one homogeneous system of parameters is tightly closed. On an earlier slide, we had marked out our systems of parameters using red triangles. And in this case, that SOP, that system of parameters, the most natural one, is x1, x2, x4, and x5, the elements that occur on the shorter diagonals. Modulo these four elements, the Artinian ring would take the form k adjoint the variable x sub 3, mod the cube of that variable. So it's very much an artin gorenstein ring. And the circle in that artin gorenstein ring would be x3 square. So once I go mod my SOP, x1, x2, x4, x5, I've killed x3 cubed, but I've not killed x3 square. So x3 square is that circle. Okay, so if the tight closure of my parameter ideal if it's at all larger than the ideal itself, then it would contain the circle. Recall that, uh, you know, uh, um, 
in R modulo that SOP, uh, any non-zero ideal, any non-zero element has a multiple in the circle. So if anything is in the circle, if anything is in the tight closure of x1, x2, x4, x5, that's not in the ideal itself, then the circle is in the tight closure. So all we need to verify is that the circle element is not in the tight closure of my chosen parameter ideal. Well, suppose x3 square is in the tight closure of x1, x2, x4, x5, then it continues to be in the tight closure when I expand to the polynomial ring S. So recall S is the polynomial ring in U, V, X, and Y. So if I translate the statement, um, you know, moving from the, I'm, I'm changing from the coordinates X sub I to the coordinates, to the subring coordinates. So in the subring coordinates, X sub three is also called U square X square plus V square Y square. The, um, the element that shows up on the size three diagonal in the matrix. So the square of the circle is the square of u squared x squared plus v squared y squared. And suppose it belongs to the parameter ideal expanded to the ring S. So the parameter ideal expanded to the ring S is generated by u to the four plus v to the four comma u cube x plus v cube y, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those binomials, it's immediately seen, involve at least a cube on one of the variables. So the expansion of my parameter ideal to S in the ring S that's contained in the ideal generated by U cube, V cube, X cube, and Y cube. Completely elementary observation, simply staring at the exponents. The square of my circle element, if I, you know, just square, if I just use the, uh, the, first possible case of the binomial theorem, the square of that is u to the four, x to the four, plus twice u square, x square, v square, y square, plus v to the four, y to the four. Now u four, x four, and v four, y four belong to the ideal on the right, namely the ideal generated by the cubes, but the middle term, which is twice u square, x square, v square, y square, it's got degree two exponents on all the variables, it does not belong. Well, it does not belong as long as two is non-zero. So this is why, if you recall, I said, we'll prove the f-rationality of Henkel rings as long as the characteristic is at least the smaller of the sizes of the matrix. So here I'm doing a three by three matrix. I need the, for this argument, I need the characteristic to be at least three. This argument does not work in characteristic two, just because in characteristic two, this middle term, the twice u square, x square, v square, y square is zero. So one has to, you know, steer clear of the structure constant. But once one does that, things work uh, in a completely elementary manner. So this is what I meant by saying that even though R is not a pure subring of S, somehow uh, one can make use of this embedding and get a rationality. So what we saw in this example works the exact same way, well, essentially, to prove uh, the theorem we obtained, namely, if the characteristic is at least t, then a t by n Henkel determinant ring is f rational. Um, what are, you know, how is the general case? Well, I mean, I did sort of uh, maybe lie a small amount in the example that we shared, the, the Henkel determinant ring is Gorenstein. So the circle is generated by one element. In general, these will not be Gorenstein, so the circle could be generated by many elements. But nonetheless, on an old slide, we had seen what the circle looks like, namely over here. And the circle, and you know, so we at least have a complete description of the circle is generated by some uh, you know, very concrete monomials one takes a, a combination of these with scalar coefficients and then runs the argument. So, uh, I, mean, I mean, in as much as the argument is any different, it's, you know, it's still uh, an elementary exercise. Uh, that's an extension of the example we have seen. So, so 
Um, wrapping up, uh, as long as the characteristic is at least T, the T by N Henkel determinant ring is F rational. And if you resort to, this, to the theorem of Karen Smith, one gets the characteristic zero version, uh, namely that over a field of characteristic zero, Henkel determinant rings have rational singularities. The, um, uh, something that's unrelated to the approach we have taken here is uh, independent of the positive characteristic K, so with no restriction on P being uh, at least T, we can show that these are F pure. Uh, what that means, if you like, is that in the positive characteristic case, the Henkel determinant ring has an endomorphism, namely the Frobenius endomorphism, and this is a pure uh, ring homomorphism. So we can prove this, but that's using a different circle of ideas, uh, sort of closer to the straightening law type of story. Um, um, it's um, not the line of argument using this embedding in a subring that we took that we took for f rationality. I should say we do expect that without any restrictions on the characteristic that Henkel determinant rings are always f regular whether P is at least T or even without that assumption, we do expect that they're always F regular. In the Gorenstein case, like the one example we saw, we can prove that F regular. We can prove this using cyclic covers, et cetera, in some other cases. But uh, to be honest, that's part of work in progress and we, we don't have the general answer. Um, it's, uh, um, yeah, so this is probably, a good time to stop uh, and uh, take questions. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. So thank thank you, Anurag, for your uh, nice talk. Now we uh, we, we can open uh, uh, the mics for uh, any discussion, questions, comments. Yeah, any, any questions from audience, they can either speak or 